This video is sponsored by Brilliant. More on that later. Hey, this is Christian, and you're watching Very Normal, a channel for teaching and talking about statistics. The one topic where you could be 95% confident about something and still be wrong. Correlation does not equal causation. Even if you're not in statistics, you've probably heard this phrase before. It's a reminder that our pattern-seeking primate brains are not always correct. Two things can look related, but this can be an illusion created purely out of randomness. In other words, we tend to see patterns in terms of cause and effect. When I take a painkiller, I expect my headache to go away. When I lift weights at the gym, I expect some gains. When you watch a video I make, you click the subscribe button. Causes make effects. But when you stop to really think about it, it can be really hard to define what a cause is. What does it mean for one event to cause another to happen? Furthermore, how can you formalize this in terms of a statistical model? Luckily for us, people much smarter than me have thought about this question a lot and turned it into its own subfield of statistics, causal inference. If you've been with this channel for a while, you might recognize that causal inference was named one of the most influential ideas in statistics in the past 50 years, and for good reason. Both pharma companies and tech companies have a massive interest in distinguishing between causes and correlations. The aim of causal inference is to take this idea of correlation does not equal causation and figure out when they are equal and what needs to be done or assumed to make them equal. But as we'll see, this is no easy task. In this video, I'm going to tell you about what haunts statisticians at night. In everyday speech, the saying correlation does not equal causation refers to the idea of seeing cause and effect between two events when in fact there isn't any. But what is correlation? And for that matter, what's causation? The first thing I'll do is distinguish between these two from a statistical lens. Broadly speaking, correlations can refer to any association between two random variables. An association is a tendency we see between two random variables. I'll focus on the type of correlation that most people know about, Pearson's correlation coefficient, and I'll denote it with the Greek letter rho. This type of correlation focuses on the linear association between two random variables. Let's say that I'm a statistics professor. Very unlikely that that'll happen, but bear with me. I've given my class a homework assignment and I collect some data on them. One of these variables is the amount of time a student works on the homework, and the other variable is the score they actually get on the assignment. One tendency I might see is that people who spend more time on the assignment will tend to have higher scores. Likewise, people who barely work on it will tend to score lower. This is what's called a positive association. I've only noticed that higher work duration is usually paired with high scores and lower duration with lower scores. This relationship is symmetric. I can also say that higher scores are associated with longer work times. Once I've collected this data, I can use this equation to calculate the correlation between these two random variables. In this case, x will refer to the time spent on homework and y will be the score they got. In the numerator, we have an expectation, which is kind of like an average. Within this expectation, we have a product. This part here describes how far a single student deviates from the average work time. And this part describes how far a student's score deviates from the average score. So this is the product of these two deviations. To show this, I'll mark the averages in the middle of our scatter plot. We can divide the plot into quadrants. Points in this region will produce positive products, while points in these quadrants will make negative products. By taking the average of all the products of all these points, we can get a sense of these two variables tend to vary more positively together or negatively. Likewise, if we have a similar number of products with similar magnitudes in all of the quadrants, taking their average cancels everything out. Visually, we can see that the second variable y doesn't vary in any particular direction no matter the value of the first value x, giving us this diffuse plot. This expectation in the numerator has a name, the covariance, and like its name suggests, it tells us how much two variables will vary from their respective means together. This denominator contains the product of the standard deviations of the two random variables. By dividing by this product, we standardize the covariance to be between negative one and positive one. This helps us control for the variances and puts correlation onto a common scale. Correlation says nothing about how one variable affects the other, only that they tend to vary from the mean in the same or opposite way. On the other hand, causation marks a clear distinction between the two variables. A change to one variable, the cause, creates a change in the other variable, the effect. Unlike correlation, 
You can't flip the relationship between the two variables. The effect depends on the cause, not the other way around. Causality is a complicated subject, and it only gets more complicated in the world of statistics, where we have to deal with randomness as well. The framework that we'll use to understand causality is the counterfactual framework. A counterfactual is something that happens counter to what actually happened. Statisticians didn't want to call it a what-if scenario, so they gave it a fancy name instead. Let's go back to my previous example. Causal inference gets really hairy when the cause variable is continuous, so I'll simplify my example a bit. Instead of letting students work on the homework however long they want, they can only work on it for either one or two hours. No more and no less. One group will opt in for one hour, and the rest will opt in for two hours. Like before, they'll do the homework and get some score. Each student has a counterfactual. For the students in the one-hour group, their counterfactuals are the score they would have gotten if they were in the two-hour group, and vice versa for the two-hour group. Let's zoom in on an individual student to get a glimpse of what a cause is. Given a student and their counterfactual, the only thing that's different between what actually happened and the counterfactual is that the student studied for an additional hour. This means that any difference between the actual and the counterfactual must be due to that one extra hour of studying. Therefore, this difference in the outcomes is the hypothetical causal effect of studying an additional hour on this student's score. In reality, we never see the counterfactual scores, but these ideas help set up how statisticians and causal inference think of causes. With this impossible to observe causal effect in mind, there are other strategies to get around this and still estimate other types of causal effects. One strategy is to calculate an average causal effect rather than an individual causal effect. This is what A-B tests and randomized clinical trials do. But here's the catch. The data from an A-B test doesn't look much different from the data I might collect from my hypothetical homework experiment. In fact, they can be analyzed with the same statistical model, like a linear regression. But one experiment gives us causal evidence, and the other one only tells us about associations. Just having data and a statistical model won't let you estimate causal effects. You need control or you need assumptions. If you don't have these, you have to deal with something much worse. Confounders. From here on out, I'll be using directed acyclic graphs, also known as DAGs, to visualize statistical relationships. In a DAG, random variables are denoted by nodes. The variable x will denote the independent variable, the thing that we as experimenters can change. I'll call this variable the exposure. Likewise, y will represent the outcome that we're interested in. An edge between these two variables indicates that there's an actual relationship between them. The arrow indicates which variable affects the other. If x points to y, it indicates that y is a function of x. For simplicity, we'll say that each edge represents the presence of a linear relationship between the two variables. So here's our problem. I've gathered data on my students about the amount of time they spent on homework and the resulting score they got. I want to know if there's a significant relationship between x and y. In other words, I want to know if an edge exists here. But I know that there are other factors that can influence both the time a student can spend on homework and the score that they'll get. These third wheels are called confounders. Confounders are variables that have an association with both the exposure and the outcome. We'll denote the confounder as C, and for simplicity, we'll make it a binary variable. For our example, our confounder will be whether or not a student has friends. Having friends can negatively affect how much time you spend on homework, but at the same time, having friends can also help increase your score if you happen to be friends with someone who actually knows what they're doing. The specific reasons don't matter here, I'm just pointing out that the presence of friends influences both the exposure and the outcome. Confounders introduce two major problems. The first problem is when there's actually no relationship between the exposure and outcome. Since the confounder is associated with both of them, changes in the confounder can create illusions of association between them. Let's say that having friends reduces your study time but increases your score. So the linear relationships might look like this. Within a class, there's going to be a mix of people who have friends and who don't. I've mocked up some code to simulate this situation. In my class of 50 students, half have no friends and the others have friends. You can see that study time has a negative association with having friends. 
and SCAR has a positive association. Note in the simulation that there's no relationship between study time and SCAR here. So theoretically, if I try to analyze it, it's more likely that I won't detect one in the form of a statistically significant p-value. But look what happens if I try to look at the relationship between study time and score here. I'll plot both the raw data using a scatter plot and a plot of the linear regression. If I didn't know any better, I might be tricked into thinking there's a small but negative relationship between these two variables. And if I actually run the analysis and ignore the confounder, I'll see a significant effect. And I'll be tricked into thinking I have a publication on my hand. But what happens when we actually do account for the confounder in the analysis? You'll see that the significant result disappears, which is what I should see. The second problem of confounders is from when there actually is a true relationship between study time and score. In the same way that confounders can create illusions of association between two variables that aren't related, confounders can also pollute a relationship that's actually there. If we see an increase in the outcome, was it because of a change in the exposure? Or was it because of the confounder? Here's the same simulation again with small modification. Score actually does have a relationship with study time. If you look at the relationship between them, we can see that there's a more clear linear relationship between them. If I were to analyze this relationship, I would see that study time has an extremely significant relationship with score. But look at the estimated regression coefficient I get. It's in the right direction, but it's smaller than what it actually should be. It's correct, but not the complete picture. Now look what happens when I account for the confounder in the analysis. The estimated effect is much more accurate, and it still maintains its statistical significance. It's clear from these two examples that the solution to confounding is to include them in your analyses. With linear regression, including confounders in the model changes how we interpret the regression coefficient for the exposure. Instead of just being an average change in the outcome for a unit increase in the exposure, the coefficient gains an added interpretation of holding other variables constant in the model. This is often phrased as controlling for other variables. Controlling for confounders allows us to isolate the relationship between the exposure and the outcome. So if that's the solution, then what stops someone from just collecting all the data they can and sticking it all in the model to isolate the association? There's actually a lot of problems with that, but I'll just focus on one here. It sounds like the obvious solution to just stick all the confounders into the model, but this makes the assumption that you know all the confounders in the first place. As a famous philosopher once said, Well, what I'm saying is that there are known knowns and that there are known unknowns, but there's also unknown unknowns, things we don't know that we don't know. No matter how much data you collect, the specter of unobserved confounders will always haunt your analysis. We make a lot of assumptions in statistics, but the assumption that you have all the confounders is a pretty strong one. So much so that no self-respecting statistician will declare that a significant association is causal in a manuscript, unless they know that the data was gathered in a specific way. We've already seen that confounders cause problems whether or not there is a relationship between the exposure and the outcome. So one that you haven't measured or don't even know about is an even bigger problem. The problem of unobserved confounders has been known for a while. At one point in history, lung cancer was a rare disease, and then cigarettes became a thing. Several famous studies started to show an association between smoking and lung cancer, but the smoking industry was quick to hire some intellectual big guns to convince people that it was all just a funny coincidence. One of those big brains was Ronald Fisher, one of the granddaddies of modern statistics. Despite several converging lines of evidence, Fisher did his best to poke holes in the statistical findings. One of the holes he used was the unobserved confounder, in this case, a gene. Fisher proposed that there was some gene that made people more likely to smoke. Not only that, but it also increased their odds of getting lung cancer. But just like how Einstein didn't get it quite right with quantum physics, Fisher was on the wrong side of history with smoking. So where does that leave us? How do we account for something that we haven't observed and might not even know that we need to observe? Are we doomed to just have spurious relationships and polluted associations? If we were, we wouldn't be able to get new medicines to people who need them. Unobserved confounders will always be a problem for statisticians and analysts, but knowing that they exist is a first step in figuring out how to overcome them. In this video, we learned about the problem of confounders and saw how they could get in the way of statisticians trying to estimate causal effects. 
Correlation does not equal causation, but that's not the whole story, at least in statistics. If an exposure causes a change in an outcome, then they're also correlated as well. Causation implies correlation, just not the other way around. Instead, a correlation is a hint to causation that could be researched further or leveraged for prediction. If you like this video, then consider subscribing to the channel. If you'd like to get videos straight to your inbox, then subscribe to the newsletter too. I don't just talk about statistics there, I've also been chronicling my YouTube journey there and things I've learned along the way. To create a successful video, I need to synthesize multiple skills together, but I don't always know these skills ahead of time. As a solo creator, I need to take the initiative and learn these skills myself. I could do it the slow way through trial and error, or I can speed things up with an organized platform like Brilliant. Statistical programming requires a lot of knowledge about computers, but I don't know a lot about how they work. I've been taking the computer science courses on Brilliant to learn more about this field from first principles. I'm the type of person who learns the fastest when I can interact directly with the concepts I'm learning, and Brilliant is great for this. If you're interested in learning from Brilliant, you can get started for free for 30 days, and the first 200 people who sign up at brilliant.org slash very normal can get 20% off an annual plan. Thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.